Hey y'all, it's Tammy with Real Southern Woman, and today we are going to be studying the fruit of love. This is where, this was our February the 12th Bible study. We're a little behind, so we're going to start in and uh, get started on this. It comes out of Galatians chapter 5, and uh, remember that we are following a, a book by Charles Stanley, so um, it's called Jesus, Our Perfect Hope by Charles Stanley. So let's get started. The fruit of love. He uses this verse. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That comes out of Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. We'll go back and read some scripture in a few minutes. Okay? It says, have you ever considered that the order in which Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit implies that the first fruit is love and that all of the other qualities associated flow from the presence of his love in you? He mentions Paul here because Paul is the writer of Galatians and he tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. Paul was originally a Jew and actually went around persecuting Christians until uh, Jesus showed him through a bright light that actually blinded him um, who he was so that Paul would believe. Not only did Paul believe, but he became an apostle of Jesus Christ and he's written many books in our New Testament that gives you an idea of who Paul was if you didn't know that. Now, Paul does uh, write this book of, to the church in Galatia. We are getting this Bible study out of this book. It says, Joy is delighting in God's love and the wonders of his creation. Peace is resting on his promises and trusting that they will be fulfilled because you know your beloved wouldn't let you down. Um, as far as the peace and the promises, God has many promises for his children. Lots and lots of really, really good ones that um, we can rest in peace on. One of those is just the fact that he went back to heaven and he's preparing a place for his children or his bride, as we call it, the church. Um, so there's many promises that God gives us and we should have peace just knowing that that is in our future. Patience is waiting for the Lord because you trust that in His love, He always gives you His best. Patience is one we all have a hard time with because we want to take control in our life of a situation instead of stepping back and let God have it or just trusting that He will take care of it. Kindness is reacting lovingly to those around you. Kindness. Um, that's what I have a hard time with. It's real easy for me to be kind to strangers but it's a lot harder for me to be kind to people who are taking care of my mother if they make a mistake, or my children, or my husband, just in general. Um, and I'm going to throw this in there. We have been watching, and I'm sure many of you have watched it. It's a series on PBS called Downton Abbey. We watched it before, and we decided to watch it again. And uh, the mother on that show has the sweetest voice. And when she talks, this is how she talks to everyone in this very kind voice. Whether it's her kids or the people who work there, that's how she talks. So I was thinking the other day, if I talk like that to my kids, I wonder how they would react if I just all of a sudden became kind. Uh, that's something to think about. Goodness is choosing to do what is right out of the love for God. And goodness is just doing what's right. Okay, faithfulness is remaining true to the Lord out of gratefulness for the love he's shown you. Gentleness is loving, empathizing, lovingly empathizing with people in need or pain. And self-control is actively resisting temptation out of love for Christ. As you open yourself to the fullness of God's love, these character qualities are going to flow from your life. So receive the Savior's love with a sincere, open, and humble heart. I'm starting here today because today's actually Valentine's Day. And this is going to uh, kind of show us what love is about. I will say that uh, the Holy Spirit does come to live within us when we uh, accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. 
It is the Holy Spirit that gives us these fruits of the Spirit. Um, so if you're not saved or you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's very possible that you've not experienced some of these fruits. Now, naturally in your fleshly human nature, you are going to experience a few of these. But I have to say joy is definitely something that actually comes from the Spirit in my opinion, true joy. Um, and there's quite a few of these that you have a hard, you'll have a lot harder time with if you don't have the Holy Spirit living within you to help you with these. Um, at the end of each lesson, Charles Stanley always writes a little prayer, and today it says, Lord Jesus, I want to know and love you more. Reveal yourself to me, my Savior, and allow your fruit to grow in me and flow through me. Amen. And then he says, my hope is in Jesus because the fruit he produces in me is wonderful. And these fruits are wonderful. There's nothing more wonderful than the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's nothing more wonderful that Jesus came here and when he left, he told his disciples that he would leave a comforter for us. And this is the Holy Spirit who gives us these fruits. So it was a wonderful gift. Not only did God give us the gift of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, He didn't just leave it there. He also gave us the Holy Spirit to help guide us so that we would have a more joyous life here on earth. Um, I want to let y'all listen to a little bit of scripture um, from this area. Now we're going to start with um, the fact that Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, and Paul um, was a Jew who persecuted Christians. And once he was saved, it was Paul who was to take the gospel to the Gentiles. If you don't know what a Gentile is, a Gentile is um, anyone who wasn't a Jew, who wasn't the chosen family of God. In the Old Testament, God speaks to his family, the Jewish family, through Abraham, through Isaac. Um, it was only the Jews who had this relationship with this holy God, um, this true relationship. Once um, Christ came out on the scene, God opened up an age of grace, allowing the Gentiles, which would be me and possibly you if you're not Jewish, to have um, a chance to be part of the family of God. Now, he did this through the Son, Jesus Christ, and it was made evident through Paul that God did want the gospel taken to all of the world and not just the Jewish people. So, um, Paul had started a few churches, and in Galatia um, was one of the churches he had started, and he was very disappointed because many of the people in this church um, had started relying on the old law customs as part of their church. Um, and they had also uh, shunned some people who were uh, doing things with the Gentiles. Um, and this was making Paul very upset. So he writes to the church in Galatia. I wanted to kind of give you a synopsis before we started into the reading because otherwise it would just go in one ear and out the other because you wouldn't really understand what was going on. So remember, this is Paul talking to the church, letting them know that he's disappointed in their actions and um, letting, him know, letting them know that this is not what Christ expects to happen with the gospel. So we're going to start with that. I'm going to open up the ESV version of the Holy Bible. Um, I like the King James, but I really like this one as well. So we're going to go back <coughs> and we're going to see how Paul talks to the church um, in Galatia. Okay. Um, now, the first chapter is mostly Paul telling you who he is and letting them know that he loves them. Um, and letting him them know that he's disappointed, okay? So we're going to, he's letting them know, it says right here, for, 
For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. He lets them know that um, not only was he in Ju Judaism, but he was one of the main ranking people up high in it. He was very intelligent, he was wealthy, he was very educated. So he says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. So he's letting them know that he didn't get his information from men. He um, got his information from the Holy Spirit um, to teach people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and then he even goes so far as to say this. He says, in what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. So he's letting them know that he means what he says, and this is serious. Um, now, when we get to chapter 2, um, he lets them know where he went to spread the gospel, okay? So we're going to kind of skip through this. He lets them know that he worked with Titus. Um, and that Titus didn't have to be circumcised, which was a law that Jewish men had to do to be righteous because Titus was Greek and he didn't force Titus to be circumcised because that was a Jewish law. Um, so he's letting them know that, that it wasn't required. So um, he lets them know that... Um, God shows no partiality, and there's no difference between him and another person. And um, then he says here, On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, when he says uncircumcised, he means the Gentiles, which is you and me, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic, apostolic ministry to the circumcised, worked also through me from mine to the Gentiles. And he's letting them know that it was him that was bringing the gospel to the Gentiles and that we were ever much, you know, entitled to be there. And that God was no, um, um, you know, he wasn't partial between a Jew and a Gentile anymore. Now, this was hard for a lot of the people, these, these people to understand and, and, and grasp. And so we're going to go on into um, an example, okay? So this is where Paul opposes Peter for something Peter's done, okay? It says, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Now, what James has done is he's eating with Gentiles, which he should do, which God showed him that he could do previously. But when other Jews came on the scene, he pulled away from the Gentiles, fearing what they would say. Now, that's what you call hypocritical, and Paul, um, Paul was not happy with him for doing this. It says, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So this shows us here that Paul was very disappointed in their hypocritical natures. He wanted them to understand that a Gentile was not a Jew. A Gentile didn't have to do things that the Jews did to be righteous, okay? Justified by faith, and then he goes on and lets us know that we are justified by we, in the grace age, are justifi justified by faith. 
not law, okay? He says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Once Jesus Christ came, the law was not any longer used as a way to be justified. When he says justified, he means saved, become righteous through Jesus Christ. So I've kind of explained to you where we are. So now I'm actually going to let um, the audio Bible read the rest of chapters 3, 4, and 5. So it's going to be a few minutes. I am going to uh, pull myself out of the screen and let y'all listen to the audio Bible. Now you can close your eyes and listen to it. That's my favorite way. Or you can watch as the text scrolls through the screen and read along with it. But I'm asking you to please, please try to listen to the words and understand what Paul is trying to tell this church. Okay? Because we are getting in to what love really is. This is almost Valentine's Day, and I want you to see where the fruit of the Spirit, how it came about. Chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not, for if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, 
in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Chapter 4 I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first, and though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that, if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out, that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, or whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically, these women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Chapter 5, chapter 5. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, 
we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. All right. He says a lot in this last chapter. He says that the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if we live in the Spirit, those of us who are saved in the age of grace, who are not obligated to the law, we will love one another as we do ourselves. These small things that we pick at and make important do not matter. If you want to flip your chapters to the front of the Bible, I'm not saying that it's not there for a purpose, but you can't make us those who are living in the age of grace, who have been saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, adhere to the old law. Before the law began with Moses, there was salvation through faith as in Abraham. So it's not like it was never like that before. So in the very beginnings of time, in Genesis, there was salvation through faith. Once Moses came into the scene, the law started for the Jewish people to set them apart from those around them, to try to show the world who God is. And they had many, many, many laws and things that they had to do. And then Christ came and he tells us in chapter, I believe it was three, that we're not even male or female once we're saved in the eyes of God. We're children of God. So he is not a respecter of persons, whether we're male or female, whether we're uh, Gentiles, which means that we're not a Jew, uh, no matter where we're from in this world, no matter where we live in this world, no matter who we are in this world, 
we all can be saved through the faith in Jesus Christ. And once we are saved by faith, we are not uh, bound to the law anymore. The law is summed up in these words that we just read. Now, does it mean we don't work for, the God, for God? Absolutely not. We need to work for the Lord. And we will be, um, once we are in heaven, and we're going to be saved and we go to heaven regardless, but once we're there, we will be judged by our works on the earth. And he's not talking about works of the law. He's talking about works and what we've done for Christ. Not whether or not we wore a white tie to church, I mean a white shirt to church, or a dress to church, or those kind of goofy things. But did we spread the gospel of Jesus Christ? Did we spread the love of the Holy Spirit? Did we radiate these things that the Holy Spirit gives us? Joy and peace and kindness and goodness. Or do we radiate the works of of the flesh, which he lists here. You know, are we prideful? Do we scorn others? Um, are we discouraging to others? Those things. So he spells out right here what love is. He spells out right here what a child of God is supposed to be like. And it is up to us whether or not we follow this. What we should follow is love and the fruits of the Spirit not the law in the Old Testament, okay? So if, you're, if you think that you're going to be saved through uh, works, he tells us in this scripture we just read, that is not what makes us righteous anymore, okay? So I hope you've enjoyed today's Bible lesson. I hope that, now when they talked about the women, uh, one was the handmaid and one was the wife and the children of the handmaid um, were blessed and so were the children of the wife. Um, that's him just trying to explain to you that God blessed the uncircumcised as, as well as he did the circumcised. It was just coming when Jesus Christ got here. He was letting us know that, you know, God, it wasn't new to God. God had it planned. And not only did he have it planned, but he told them in the Old Testament how it was going to work. And they still had a hard time accepting that all these things that they did didn't make them righteous. They had a hard time accepting that a Gentile could be just as righteous as they are. Because they looked on the outside for a lot of things that didn't matter. So y'all keep that in mind. Um, if you're ever at church and you find yourself glancing at somebody... And now, as far as dressing modestly, I think we should dress modestly. But as far as what we've got on, it doesn't make any difference. God cares about what's in our heart. So remember that the next time you're at church. Are you focusing on worshiping the Lord, or are you focusing on works of the flesh? If you're focusing on works of the flesh, then you need to do a checkup and think about what's in your heart, because that's what God sees. He sees our heart, not the outside appearance, not what everybody else sees, okay? I will end in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word, and we thank you uh, for Paul. Without Paul, there would be so much missing, and I'm sure that if you didn't use Paul, you'd have used somebody else, but Paul was wonderful, and I praise you for saving him and making him into the apostle um, that is just an amazing man of God who wrote down in your word um, from the Holy Spirit these beautiful words. Um, we thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your love. And I hope and pray that if anything that we get out of this, we can see that what you want from us more than anything is for us to live through the Spirit and radiate these fruits of the Spirit so that your gospel can be spread about abroad and people will want what we have. Who wouldn't want joy and love and peace and kindness and gentleness in their life? In Christ's name we pray. Amen.